Hello, also, uh, this is Hagby Accounts, and they're just going to proceed with group accounts. So, it's normally known as consolidation of financial statements, just this day. Okay, uh, let's just proceed. But first of all, it's better that you know, we have, we have, we have written the word group accounts, but also consolidation of financial statements. You really need to know the meaning of those two words, consolidation, but also group. What does a group constitute? All right. Now, if for that, let's just start this one. Group accounts topic actually covers the following standard. We have several IFRS and IAS uh, in this one. First of all, is IFRS 10 that is called consolidated financial statements. You know, you might be company A, and maybe you have acquired your you have acquired shares of company B for more than 50%. And we usually say that you control that entity. And so we say that you are a parent and that entity is a subsidiary. Now, having said that, uh, you can prepare a group. You can combine your financial statements with the financial statements of that other company. And the combination of the two is what is called, is known as a group. So a group is just a combination of a parent and its subsidiary, all right? So that is IFRS 10, and then we have IFRS 3 called business combination. You know, uh, it is usually explained when, when something is said to be a business, but also when you combine business, the same way, when you combine a business, when you combine businesses, let's say two businesses become one by acquiring more than 50% of shares, for example, we usually determine something called goodwill. You know, goodwill is an intangible asset. It's an asset that initially wasn't available in the books, but after purchasing someone, we believe that you paid for it. And that's why you find out that you paid for more than what was actually the value of that business at fair value. So you say that you have business combination. So we'll see very clearly. And then we have FRS 11, uh, joint arrangement. Of course, for those doing financial reporting are not doing this one. Right, and then we have IFRS 12 that is called disclosure of interest in other entities, except entities that we can actually explain. And then we have S28 that is called investments in associated and joint ventures. And now, uh, if for the basics, we'll just take a look at uh, subsidiaries, I mean the company for which you control, and then associates, the company for which you have significant influence, but not control or joint control. All right, now let's start with uh, what do we mean by FRS 10 consolidated financial statement? Simply speaking, we say that an entity that is a parent is required to prepare consolidated financial statements. If you are a parent, may, let's say if you are you're a company and you, you have control of, of other company, you have to combine your results of the results of your own results and results and the results of those two companies, right? And that's what we call consolidated financial statement. So if you do not control an entity, we do not say that that is a consolidated financial statement. No. You say something is consolidated, we consider a parent and a subsidiary. Okay. So this standard provides the following definition. You have to know about the following definition. I think I've already spoken about them. We have a parent. A parent is just an entity that controls another entity. The key word here is control this is the keyword control right and then have a subsidiary a subsidiary is an entity that is controlled by another entity so if company a let's for example own 70 percent share of shares of company b that means company a is a parent of company b and company b is a subsidiary of company a Hello. all right so that's what uh, we usually have to do. So you need to know the definition of the parent, but also of the subsidiary. And then you can just see other definitions. Of course, they are not under FRS 10, but they are under the same topic. There is something called an associate. Now you can distinguish between an associate and a subsidiary. An associate is an entity over which an investor has significant influence. This is the keyword, significant influence, and which is neither a subsidiary nor an interest in a joint venture. So it's something not a subsidiary. You have significant influence. You know, when you have control over something, it's obvious that you have significant influence. But when you have significant influence, it does not necessitate that you have control or joint control, right? That's why we're specifying an associate is one uh, on which an entity or an investor has significant influence. 
price. Later, I will see all you can see just now what significant influence is. By saying significant influence, we just refer to the power to participate in the financial and operating policy decisions of an investee, but it is not control or not control. So you can just participate in the decisions, but it, that doesn't mean that you control an entity or maybe you have joint control. No. So soon we're just going to take a look and make a clear distinction between subsidiary and the associate. All right, so just proceeding, we say an investor, there is something very important here. We say that if you control an entity, you can call it a subsidiary. Now, an investor controls an investee when there are three conditions. Usually, we have three conditions. The first condition here, we say, when an investor has power over the investee, that's number one. And if you have power over investee, if you, if you do not have power over investee, that means you cannot do anything regarding that investee, so it's all that you, you do not control. Don't worry about this, we're just going to see the meaning of this power. And then, if you have power, power itself is not sufficient. So we say that an investor is exposed or has rights to variable returns from its involvement with the investee. So you have power, but you, it's either that you are exposed to rights, or maybe you actually have those rights. You know, by being exposed, you might not hold something, obviously, but maybe uh, you can have you can have the right to exercise maybe to exercise something and argument have those rights. So that's why we say either exposed or you have rights to variable returns from its involvement with the investee. You know, by returns, let's presume maybe dividends could be an example of returns, right? But also, as you see here, those returns, for example, dividends should be variable. We have written here variable, you know. For example, preference shareholders are, are entitled to dividends, but actually they cannot vary those dividends. Those dividends are not variable, all right? So that's why you say an investor is exposed or has rise to variable return. This word variable is also important here. And right <coughs> now, we have said that these are variable. You should be able to vary them yourself, to call yourself uh, being control the controller of uh, a subsidiary. That's why we say... <coughs> The investor has the ability to affect those returns through its power over the investee. So if the returns are variable, but you cannot you cannot you cannot actually affect those those, those returns, that means that they are variable, but you, can, you, you just expect others to vary them, to change them. You cannot change them by yourself. So this is the complete meaning of the word control. You should really know about this, right? Okay. Actual also see actually when you say power, what do we mean by power? Soon, or maybe I can just specify it now. When we speak of that power, we say that power should be substantive rather than protective. You know, you can have the power to prevent something from happening, but maybe you cannot have the power to decide something happening. That power should be substantive, not merely protective. Okay. Just let's go for further definitions. The topic itself was group accounts. Now, what is a group? A group is just a parent and all of its subsidiary. So you get the picture here that a group does not constitute an associate. It's just a parent and all of its subsidiaries. And now when we say consolidated financial statements, what do we mean by that? You know, you can have a company, maybe a parent, and maybe the current a parent has two subsidiaries. But when you consolidate them, you just present a single financial statement, maybe financial position, profit loss, and other financial statements. So we say that consolidated financial statements present the assets, liabilities, equity, income expenses, and cash flow of the parent and its subsidiaries as if they were a single economic entity. This is the key word here. We have spoken a lot. But simply speaking, when you call something consolidated financial statements, it means that you present uh, figures of all the entities as, as, as if it was just a single economic entity. If someone comes and take a look, takes a look at the financial statements, you won't be they won't be able to say that oh, this is a for parent, this one for subsidiary one, for subsidiary two. No, it is as if they are a single economic entity. That's the point here. And then I told you uh when you when you have Control, first of all, you have power over investee. Now I'm just defining that word power. 
power is simply the right. You know, you have the right to do something, and then we say you have power. Whenever you decide, whenever you decide to exercise your rights, and then we say that you have power. So power is the existing rights that give the current ability to direct the relevant activities of the investee. If you have the ability to direct relevant activities, that we say that you have power. All right. Now don't worry about that. We're just going to take a look at what we mean by relevant activity. The, the existing right to direct what? But before that, we can also take a look at something called non-controlling interest. Simply speaking, you know, non-controlling interest is, let's say you have gone to a company, you have purchased 80% of the shares, we mean that you control by 80%, but that 20% actually, you have just sold it there and actually some others have retained it. So non-controlling interest is just the equity in a subsidiary that you are acquiring that is not directly or indirectly attributable to a parent. You go there and purchase 80%, that means 20% is none of your business. So that's what we do not control. So we call it non-controlling interest. And that's why that 80%, you can call it parent interest, right? So that's what we call non-controlling interest. All right. Now, uh, our main focus was just on, was still on power, which we said is existing rights, giving the current ability to direct relevant activity. All right. Since I just I just need to define the two, it explain these relevant activities, I just need to repeat this word power over investing. You know, when I, I said that to control an entity, you should have power over investing, and then I had the two other conditions. Now I'm on that condition number one, that is called power over investing. Mm -hmm. So power can be obtained either directly from the ownership of the majority of voting rights or potential voting rights, you know. You may be maybe owning a company by 60%. Actually, you say that you have that power. But maybe you just have potential voting rights. You know, by potential voting rights, it's like maybe you may be holding, you may have invested in convertible debts in a company. But when you have convertible debt, maybe you have the right to convert them to shares. And you find out that uh, when you convert them to shares, you will be owning more than 50%. And actually, there is a very, very high possibility that you will convert because you will gain more. So say that you have potential voting rights, right? So for example, just given this example, let's say you have the right, the meaning of power in this team, you know? maybe the right to appoint, reassign, or remove key management personnel who can direct the relevant activity. Just like that, a very, very nice example. You own 80% of shares in a company. That means you're a shareholder and you can, you can decide maybe to appoint, to reassign, or remove key management personnel. You know, management is the one uh, that controls the entity. For corporate governance reasons, we will say that there should be separation of ownership and control. Owners should not should not actually run the business. So if you have that right to appoint them, that means you can change the way the company is directed and controlled, and so you say you have power. Maybe the right to appoint or remove another entity that directly direct the relevant activity. Let's say it's that way. You have the company. Right, you have the company, and maybe uh, you control a certain company, and that company is the one that controls another company. So, if you if, to say that you have power over that other company, we say that if you can affect that company that controls the other company, we say that you also have power because uh, your decision would ultimately reach to that entity. And then you can say that rights to direct the investee to enter into all veto changes are to trans, let's say transaction for the benefit of the investor. Just something like that. So these are just examples, all right? And now, uh, let's say other rights, such as those specified maybe in a management contract. Let's say it's a contract. We say that, oh, you do not own 50%, but the contract says that you, you own only 30%, but contractual, contract contract wise, let's say you would have control over this entity. So that should be specified in the contract. All right, I would just like to explain another thing before proceeding. You know, when we are speaking of non controlling interest here, we say that that is directly on or indirectly. You know, you can be a parent and maybe you control a subsidiary, and that subsidiary controls another subsidiary. So you may be controlling something directly or you may be controlling something indirectly. That's why when speaking of non-controlling interest, 
it won't matter whether you control an entity directly or indirectly. Don't worry about this. In SPR, you have to cover each and everything. All right, no, not here. This is something I specified very, very early. Such rights should be should not merely be protected, but substantive. Do not just say, oh, maybe I have the right to prevent something, but not the right to do something. You should actually have the right to do something, not just to prevent something from happening. All right? For today, I just need us to go through this example, this just this explanation. After this, no problem. There are very things that are very important. Okay, what are these relevant activities? Because we said that power is the existing rights that give an entity the current ability to direct relevant activities. What are these relevant activities now? Are ah, those activities that significantly affect the investee's return? Let's just take a look at those, those activities. For example, maybe. Selecting acquisition and disposal of assets. Making that decision to acquire and dispose of assets, you know, that actually covers investing activities. Investing activities in a firm is something that is very important. So we say that an example of relevant activity. Maybe managing financial assets during the lifetime. You know, an example of financial assets could be maybe an investment of shares, maybe we've invested in a certain company, maybe we've invested in debt. Right in a certain company. So that's an, just an example, but also let's say goods or services to be purchased and sold. You, if, you, if you can decide on the goods to be purchased and sold, you know, it's like you are, you are trying to detect the nature of the business. So it's obvious that's the relevant activity. Another example could be maybe determining the funding structure, financing activity. Let me tell you one thing. If you have taken a, a good look at all this, and if you know how we deal with the segment of cash flows, you will remember something. When preparing the segment of cash flows, you have operating activities, investment activities, and financing activities. And we have spoken about all those three activities here. The first one and the second are about investing activities. Good intention to be purchased and sold about operating activities. And determining the funding structure is all about financing activities. So it's just like that. And now you can proceed and say, we can summarize the different types of investments and the required accounting for them as follows. Okay, you see this table. This table actually is like you're just trying to go to the calculations, although you're still having to make some explanation. But this is what we'll be dealing with all along. So, you know, when, let's say, let's take a, a good look at percentage of ownership of share. You call, you can call and you can regard an entity as a subsidiary if you control it. We have spoken about this already. A nice example of controlling a subsidiary is this one. When you own more than 50% of the shares, this one is a very nice example. All right. What do you do about that? If something is a subsidiary, we say that you do full consolidation, and that's why. We call it consolidated financial statement. Consolidated in full. We have standards to follow, actually. You know, you can follow standards like uh, IFRS 10, but also we have something called business combination, IFRS 3. We saw it earlier. Now, you can call something an associate if you only have significant influence. Now, what constitutes significant influence if nothing is told to you? When you own an entity from 20%, by 20% to 50%, we call that an associate. So we restrict that. When it is 50%, that one is an associate, not a subsidiary, unless further information is given. In that way, we use equity accounting. Equity accounting is a very easy method compared to consolidation, to consolidation. You just account for equity, you know equity. Whenever something affects equity, it's when we act on that. You just change the equity of the associate and then go to the equity of the group and you proceed. We'll see about this, don't worry about this at all. And this equity accounting is usually explained under IAA S28. So I think I've spoken about this full consolidation that will do business combination, IFRS 3, but after IFRS 10 will also be involved. Here we involve ourselves with IAS 28. We specified it very, very early at the beginning of the standard. And then you can have something called investment, which is none of the above. When you are owning an asset, a subsidiary, 
I mean, when you're owning an entity for less than 20% of shares, we presume it to be a normal trading investment. It's just a normal investment of shares. You receive your dividend and then you proceed with your life. So no worries at all. And for this one, we usually deal with financial instruments as for a simple company account. But IFRS 9, IFRS 9 is just financial instruments, measurement, and actually recognition. All right? So this is what uh, you have to, have to know about the summary of financial or consolidation of financial statements, or simply speaking, group accounts, right? Right now, you can proceed here and say that uh, FRS 10 simply states that investors should periodically consider whether control over an investee has been gained or lost. You know, right now, you might be controlling an entity, but maybe uh, after a while, you do not, you no longer control it. Why? Let's, let's say uh, a, a company had issued 2 million shares and we are having 1.5 million shares. That is 75%. You're controlling it. And maybe later, uh, further shares are issued and another entity purchases them. So the shares increase, let's say, from 2 million shares are issued. So from 2 million, they increase to 4 million, but you still have 1.5 million. Now, 1.5 million over 4 million, you have that 7.5. You have lost control. So that's why you say investors should periodically consider whether control has been gained or lost. If you, are, if, if you are having control, you are treating it as a subsidiary and you have lost control, it's now an associate. If it was an associate and now you have gained control, you have to treat it as a subsidiary. So that's why you usually have to check for that, right? Because there are some circumstances that may lead to that. All right, now uh, here you are usually asked about this question. Explain the situation where an investor can have power over investing or simply speaking, when you can say that you are controlling an investee or something is a sub, you regard something as a subsidiary to you because controlling it is like regarding it as a subsidiary. So you can be told when you say you have power of investee, as you see here, yeah? but also when you control something, all that is possible. First example, this question is also common. Exercise of majority of voting rights in an investee. We have spoken about that already. You own more than 50%, it's obvious that not. Regardless of how they combine, the others combine to go against you, to stand against you, they won't win because uh, you are already owning more than what they would actually gather together, all right? But another example is contractual arrangements between actually the investor and the parties. Let's say that uh, you have only 30%. But you have entered into a contract in such a way that you will be exercising control or maybe you will be having power over, over the investee. So we say that no problem, you have power over investee or maybe you have control. Another example here, we say holding less than 50%, you are holding less than 50% shares, but all other equal the interest held by the numerically large is dispersed and unconnected group. What do we mean by this? You know, you may be controlling, you may be having 45% to such an extent that if others combine, they could have 55 and successfully go against you. But right here, we are saying that presume that we have 45, but maybe others, first of all, there are so many. We have said numerically, like there are so many, they are dispersed, maybe they are on different continents. That's just an example and they are unconnected. So it is be very difficult for them to come together against you and host out your decisions. Usually we call this de facto control, de facto control simply speaking. We call this de facto control. And maybe another example, you say you have potential voting rights. For example, share options or convertible or not, or maybe convertible preference shares, whatever. As I told you, when you say something is potential, that means it is not existing. It is, no, it is not in existence currently, but it could change at any point in time. That's what we call potential voting rights. And I told you, you have share options. Let's say uh, an entity has issued 2 million shares, and currently you only have, uh, you only have 1 million shares. That is 50% and you don't have control. But mm -hmm. you own share options of which if you decide to exercise, Maybe you would have more shares 
that will give you more than 50%. And you say that that possibility of you changing is in the money, is very possible. Let's say you are told that you have an option to purchase one share for one dollar, while at that day you find out that the, the market value of shares is five dollars. So it's obvious that you would be you would have to purchase because you would be purchasing something more valuable for a much less amount. So we call those potential voting rights. But also that could be possible maybe for convertible debt or convertible loan instead of being paid the money. You receive shares, and if you receive shares, maybe you own more than 50%, and that's why we call potential voting rights, right? Okay, so those examples that will be asked in an exam. All right, now let's go for the value consolidation exemption. You say that, oh, I do not want to consolidate the financial statement. You know, an entity may complain. Why should I complain? Why should I make the consolidated financial statement? I already, I already have my own separate financial statement. Why? <clears throat> Why should I have to consolidate? So these are the valid exemptions. You can claim this and you can be claiming it in a rightful way. I understand permits actually exemption from consolidating under the following scenarios, but provided all of them are actually made. Whenever you fail one, you have to consolidate. First of all, it is a wholly owned or partially owned subsidiary where the owners of the non-controlling interest do not object to the non-preparation. -prepar did you see that? Did you just see this? It is a wholly owned or partially owned subsidiary. What do we mean by it? Simply speaking, if, if the company is a subsidiary, that means there is another company above it, so there is its own parent. So first of all, let's say you are company A and you are owned by company B. So company B is above you. And let's say company B owns company A by uh, 80%. That means it doesn't own it by 20%, right? So you are company A, you are owned by company B, but maybe you are also owning other companies. Maybe you are owning company C. So you are a parent to company C. But can you can avoid preparing the quantitative financial statements for you and, and company C if you just take a look above above you for those who are having shares in you. First, maybe company B is owning you by 80%, but in company B will prepare the financial statement, right? Then those 20% owners of you maybe have not have not objected. That's why we are saying it is a wholly owned or partial owned subsidiary where owners of the non-controlling interest do not object to the non-preparation. In case those owning you 20% say that, no, you have to prepare, you have to prepare, because you know they have shares in you, you have to prepare, you have to prepare. No way, you just have to prepare that, right? That's what I wanted to skip over. And maybe you have another example, you say that it's state or equity instruments are currently not traded in a domestic or foreign market. Simply speaking, Let's maybe let's let me give you an nice example. You know, when 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 an entity has its share or securities listed when a public market, it's obvious that it cannot avoid consolidation of financial statements if it's a parent. So if they are listed, you would have to prepare the consolidated financial statement. You cannot avoid it. Or maybe if you are in a process of preparing, you would also have to prepare. That's why we say if it is not in the process of having any. That or equity instrument traded on a domestic or foreign market. Even if you are in your process, you cannot avoid preparation. And the, the other one, you say that the ultimate parent entity produces consolidated financial statements that comply with IFRS standards and which are available to the public. You know, when speaking of something called an ultimate, an ultimate are uh, you know, maybe you can be a parent, but you are owned by another sub company, and that company is owned by another, and that one is owned by another. So all those above you, as long as they are owning others, they are also your parents. So right here, we are speaking on the ultimate parent, right? Yeah, so you have to know something like that. Too. Then maybe you have, you can have also have invalid reasons for excluding a subsidiary from consolidation. You can have invalid reasons for excluding a subsidiary from consolidation. When can you get those ones? 
all right so go for the invalid reasons now it may happen that you need uh, to avoid consolidation but you will be told no you have to consolidate so the following are uh, totally invalid first of all long-term restrictions on the ability to transfer funds to the party to the parent and you know there is something that's why there is this kind of tax that is established is called repatriated income someone comes to a country they establish a company and all the car the funds that are generated are taken back uh, to their own country so if you have long-term long-term restrictions on the ability to transfer the funds no problem you say that you can still control an entity even if uh, there are such restrictions the other point the subsidiary undertakes different activities and or maybe operates in different locations. That's no reason for excluding something from the consolidation. You are in Nigeria, your subsidiary is in the US. You cannot say I cannot consolidate because my subsidiary is far. No, that's not allowed. Or maybe you are dealing with uh, mechanizing business, mechanizing maybe of goods, and maybe uh, your subsidiary is, is actually a, a, a a food chain, you cannot avoid consolidation for such a reason. Another reason we say the subsidiary has made losses or has significant liabilities, which the, which the directors uh, would prefer to exclude from group accounts. That too is not allowed because it would be just to improve maybe the overall reported financial performance and position. You say, oh, my subsidiary has obtained, I've incurred a lot of losses. If I combine our results, the results of the group will be poor. That's not allowed. All right, you have to note something down here. First of all, we say immaterial subsidiaries may not need to be consolidated as a FRS. You know, all the FRS, even the concept of framework, consider the, the point of materiality. Materiality are uh, something is material if it's capable of influencing economic decisions of users. So if something is immaterial, you may just ignore it. You may not consolidate it, no problem. Because it's immaterial, so it won't affect, uh, it won't have an impact on the economic decisions of users of the financial statements. But also we say a subsidiary acquired for a sale. You know, it may happen, there are companies that purchase some companies which actually have potential, but actually maybe they are currently underperforming. They purchase them, they improve them, and when they are stable, the share price is right, they sell out them out. So subsidiaries that are acquired for sale with the intention of selling them, uh, and that they meet the criteria for IFRS 5. You know, IFRS 5 is a third called non-current asset held for sale and discontinued operation. So if they are meeting that criteria as being held for sale, you cannot consolidate them in a normal way. That's why we say they shall be consolidated, but in a different way. So we have things like this that you have to, to consider. All right. Now, when preparing the group accounts, the date of acquisition at which control is attained should be noted and goodwill is computed as per IFRS 3 at this stage. Do not worry about this. We are just going to take a very, very deep look, deeper look into this one after another you need to do this one as if you have never done consolidation of financial statements so we are just dealing with some examples right yeah just dealing with some examples and maybe there is nothing much here so later i will see about how to consolidate the financial statement